Good evening, and thank you for coming to this event uh, with the uh, delightful Catherine Brodsky, who is a visiting fellow at the Institute. Catherine's a journalist and author, essayist and commentator, and has been taking an especially keen interest in emerging technologies and their impact on society. She has contributed to publications such as Variety, The Washington Post, Wired, The Guardian, Esquire, Newsweek, Mashable, and many others. So she's got a widespread journal audience. Over the years, she has interviewed a diverse range of intriguing personalities, including numerous Oscar, Emmy, Tona, Tony, Pulitzer, and Nobel Prize winners and nominees, including, who wasn't a Tony Award winner, the Dalai Lama. She's, <laughs> she's the author of an upcoming book based on some of these interviews called No Apologies, How to Find Our Voice in the Age of Outrage. So the age of outrage is, I think, where we're at at the moment which comes out on January the 29th, 2024, and is currently available to you all for pre-order. So I invite Catherine to decipher truth, if she can, in the age of AI. Thank you so much for coming. And I'm going to attempt to decipher a little bit of truth in this age of AI, because I think without the truth, we're pretty much lost. So, you know, we count on our accurate understanding of the world to figure out what it is that we should do, what is actually going on in the world. And without that, we're going to support the wrong things, we're going to condemn the wrong people and celebrate the wrong people as well. So it's very, very important for us to be able to know what is actually going on. And as we see with conflicts around the world, most recently, you know, with Ukraine, uh, Russia, Israel, Palestine, there's just no shortage of narratives, videos, photos, and uh, some of them are accurate and some of them are complete misrepresentations of reality. So although my talk today is going to focus largely on AI and disinformation. The truth is, is in our current world, we don't even need to do fakes to spread fake information, false narratives, right? You just change the headline on a photo or a video, you put it out of context. You know, for example, it might be shot in Syria, but you say it's shot somewhere else. Um, and you quickly can watch it spread by huge, accounts with huge followings, and as I call them, um, you know, puppets, <laughs> because they hang out to their every word and they're manipulated. And that's how lies can become accepted truths. At the same time, you know, there is no denying that AI is going to make all of this so much more difficult, so much the problem, so much more vast and more difficult to overcome. So even though, even today, with more limited use of AI in these contexts, this is just gonna get better. And you know, because I'm a journalist, um, so-called journalist anyways, <laughs> some of the, one of the things I wanna address first is AI as it relates to journalism and the spread of disinformation. So, you know, I wouldn't like to start with a threat to journalism, something that's been my field for uh, over 15 years now. And, you know, journalism has been under attack for quite a while. This is nothing new. It's been attack, under attack from all sides. Budget cuts, the internet, activists posing as journalists, I would say, is uh, uh, one of the issues. have sort of abandoned the foundation, the ethics of reporting. And, you know, politics on all sides have also dis dis have had really a big impact on journalism. And all of this has contributed to distrust in journalism across all aisles, I would say, but not just journalism, also institutions in general. Because without that trust in media, our ability to know what is true and what is not true also evaporates, it's severely limited. And I don't know about Hungary specifically, so I won't comment on um, the state of media here, but according to Gallup polls in America, 
the trust in media is at an all-time low. So only 34% of U.S. adults have a great deal or fair amount of confidence as of 2022. And it has been declining for decades. So Americans seem to have less trust in their media institutions than nearly every country in the world. And undeniably, I think it's important to say, well, media institutions have to take some credit for that, some degree of responsibility to getting to this point, and they need to figure out ways to correct course because, you know, that is critical for our sense making to be able to trust these institutions to provide accurate information. But as a result of this failure of trust, failure of these institutions, people have been turning to alternative area, places to get their information. These alternative sources, however, don't mean that they have less of an agenda. And they, in fact, often have less stringent vetting and research. And it doesn't mean that they're less ideologi ideologically captured either. Often they're more because they're motivated to create their content for a reason. And so, you know, if we trust in bad information, it means that we might support decisions that would have terrible consequences, particularly when it comes to things like policy. And while I see AI as a powerful tool that can help journalists with research and get important stories out quicker because you don't have to do sort of the you know, mundane sort of work, um, I'm, I'm not you know, I'm not at all all gloom and doom when it comes to AI, right? So while I'm, I'll be talking about some of the issues, it doesn't mean there aren't also wonderful things that it can accomplish. And I can see how it can change our world for the better. And I always, I've always loved innovation. I've always geeked out over emerging technology. So it's quite fun <laughs> to, to see what's coming out. And, you know, one thing that I love as a journalist, like I don't have to transcribe anymore. I can do more interviews because I hate transcribing and that's what keeps me from doing some writing. It's great at summarizing articles and data. It can recommend stories that might be relevant for research or for readers that might be interested in a particular topic. It can recommend artic more articles that they might be interested in. I use it for brainstorming, so I don't have to st stare at a blank page, something that's the bane of all writers. Um, and it can also use, I can also use it to generate images to accompany my stories, because I can't afford to pay a graphic designer. But at the same time, what I worry about is that we are building tools without fully exploring the consequences of these tools. We're going too fast, and we're not really thinking of how to manage that. We're just thinking of how to put out new tools. So a number of media outlets in the last few years, they've been utilizing AI to actually write entire stories. Supposedly, they say it's with human oversight. Uh, but, you know, as we can see, it has backfired in times, right? So AI, of course, you know, is based on training data. That training data has biases, something that has been talked about a lot, and that's a, a large concern when it comes to machine-generated um, content. But, you know, humans are also deeply flawed, biased, they make mistakes, they have their perceptions. So, you know, you can say both have potentially equal virtues and faults. However, I would like you to consider Exhibit A. So this is, a, this is a story that was generated by Microsoft Travel Guide. It was a forward enough. So basically they made recommendations for people traveling to Ottawa, 10 places to go to, and number three happened to be the Ottawa Food Bank. <laughs> so, so miss number one. And miss number two, it encouraged uh, visitors to come on an empty stomach. Now, here's the thing. I mean, I know some people know very bad journalists, but even the worst journalists I know probably would not have made that particular mistake. And this is something that human beings, it just kind of shows us the difference between how human beings think and how computers claim to think. So... This is just one of the many public fails that have happened, and probably some that we haven't ever spotted. And, you know, it's very important that these stories, I think, that are generated by AI get great oversight 
And clearly in this case, it shows us that despite their claims, it was not good oversight. They need to be triple checked by human beings. But also I think they need to be labeled as AI generated content, which right now they're not quite doing. They're, they're putting vague, sometimes bylines, you know, generated by something, but it doesn't actually say that this is not human made. But of course, um, AI has other issues. So as a lazy person, I'm always trying to find the, the best solution to, to not do as much uh, grunt work as possible. So I had to recently, for a book proposal, or actually for my book, <laughs> I had to put all my citations in APA format. And I thought, hmm, AI can do that for me. I don't need to waste my time. And things seem to be going pretty, pretty well, I would say, until because I did triple check, I discovered that the chat, uh, it wasn't ChatGPT, another tool, but both ChatGPT and this other tool, both were using, they were making up the names of the authors of the articles completely, and in some cases, dates. And, and they were like perfectly legitimate sounding names, right? And I think this is what we're gonna see more and more of. And that is attributed to something called hallucination, right? And had I not checked and verified, I'd be far more embarrassed than I am right now sharing this with you. But what is it that caused AI to lie about the authors? Well, so this hallucination is basically, you take a large language model and it perceives patterns or objects that are non-existent. And while a lot of, Developers are focused on just trying to solve this problem, and it, it's constantly improving. It's not solved right now, and some believe that it will never be solved. So how can you trust AI to generate something? And, and will we ensure that you know, these editors are, in fact, checking it as thoroughly as this? Does it take them more time to verify than it is to write that story? So, you know, these tools like ChatGPT, which is probably the one that everybody's heard of, um, they're trained to predict strings of words, but they're not able to um, figure out when there is a factual inconsistency. So the outputs could be make no sense, be inaccurate, or just plain made up. But unlike humans, they're not doing it to, for an agenda. They're just doing it to please us, essentially. And so another concern of mine for, you know, Google has its own set of problems, right? Um, they've, some of the search results have been evaporating, disappearing from, and our whole sort of history in some ways is being erased. So that's one problem, but we'll leave that as, aside for a second, right? So with Google, when I'm searching or another search engine, I can see the source of the information and I can evaluate, should I be, taking it seriously or not, particularly as a journalist. But what I worry about is that eventually, and this is not just for journalists, but for everyone, if you're just asking the question and you don't get any indication where that information came from, where did that answer come from? I think that has a big implication. And I've tried to ask things like ChatGBT for um, citations. It refused to give them to me. So then, um, th but there are some, to this may change, especially if there is more pressure from the outside world, if we demand that. Uh, there are tools like, say, Perplexity, which is a ChatGBT-like tool as well, and that is able to give you citations. So I think it's important for us to understand where that information is coming from. And if we're just getting answers, we're not getting that. And there's also a really big concern that as we use more and more AI tools to generate content, there's going, next time it upgrades itself, what it's going to upgrade itself is not gonna be human data set, it's gonna be AI generated data set, which is also often false because it makes things up. So those are really big things that we need to be thinking about. And then also, you know, another thing that I've uh, come across recently is that a very big uh, image licensing company, uh, they were providing images that were completely AI generated of a war situation, a real war, but they were licensing images that were AI generated, so fake. Um, and this is on a very mainstream platform. So, 
you know, AI is also, as much as it can free us in some ways, it is also a tool that can be used for censorship. So it's not uncommon for videos or posts to be removed for violating rules. In fact, you might, you know, you might not have the human capability to find all the things that violate terms and remove them. And so what happens is, you know, I, I'm sure many of us have had the experience of um, maybe having something of ours removed uh, almost immediately after it was posted, or, you know, I've complained about certain posts and immediately got turned down <laughs> or sometimes approved, but it's not a human being. It's not like all these social media companies are employing lots and lots of people. It's AI tools that are doing this. Um, and they can get it very wrong. And in fact, they often do. So um, it's a big, to me, like the bigger concern is actually when governments get involved in this situation. So researchers from Freedom House, which is a nonprofit human rights advocacy group, dem pro-democracy group, they found that 22 countries pass laws that require or incentivize internet platforms to use machine learning to remove unfavorable online speech. That's quite a few. And then on top of that, they found that 40, at least 47 governments have used commentators to manipulate online speech and discussions in their favors. And they were using bots, um, humans, AI, well, bots with AI, which is a double the number from a decade ago. And that's only going to increase. Their research also documented the use of generative AI in 16 countries to saw doubt, smear opponents, or influence public debate, according to a report from earlier this year. And governments and those connected with them have also been recruiting people known as influencers to help spread misleading content. So they provide them with the content, they pay them money, and they try to manage public discourse in their favor. And then there are also many websites, I think, again, most of you have probably stumbled across them by accident. They pose looking like they're legitimate media publications, and they mimic the American, British, French, and other international media, and they try to spread false narratives. And we see a lot of that was being done during Russian invasion of Ukraine, but it happens in many other contexts as well. But Russia also used um, a network called Cyberfront Z through Telegram. And what they do is they mob mobilize commentators to post on other platforms and share anti-Ukraine propaganda and attack people who might be critical of Putin. So, you know, why is this important? Because AI bots, they can be used to change sentiments. They can make people think there is a consensus when there is no consensus. They might make it seem like there's overwhelming support for a particular policy or, and they spread information and often false information. So in China, they had chatbots who have been programmed to not answer questions about Tiananmen Square, for example. And China was actually named by Freedom House as the world's worst environment for internet freedom in general. Now, there's probably worse environments. I just don't think they've had a chance to um, look at certain countries like, say, North Korea. Um, and in India, Prime Minister Modi's administration ordered YouTube and Twitter to restrict access to a documentary about violence during his tenure as chief minister of the state of Gujarat. And in 55 of the 70 countries covered by Freedom House's Freedom on the Net report, individuals faced legal repercussions from their online speech. They were also physically assaulted or killed for their online commentary. And that happened in 41 countries. So of course, you know, false, as, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, false images and videos have existed for a very long time. But these days, the problem is that it's so much easier to scale that up. In the past, if you wanted to make a really convincing video or an image, you know, you needed to have some basic knowledge of the tools and, and spend some time on it. The thing is now with this technology, you know, you can just describe what you want, you're gonna get an image, you're gonna get a, a video, and you can also copy 
your somebody's voice. So, you know, I've been talking for a little while here now, hopefully not boring you too much, but my voice can be used, just this recording alone can be used to create a, a fake of my own voice. So, um, and that is an issue because it, it really, the voice cloning, as it's called, is, is that software is widely available to anybody and there's not any built-in safeguards. So this poses a real problem for those of us who actually care about what is true and what is not. And it affects both journalists who get a lot of information from available sources, right? Because, well, where, where are journalists getting their information? So if they're finding sources that have been faked, they might rely on that for their stories. And as a result, some of them have been caught reporting on things that are not true. And then, of course, the general public is also often, very often, fooled by AI-generated content. And, you know, bad actors, they seem to take a, on a policy of fake it till you make it. So they will, you know, create their own media outlets and disseminate false information through those media outlets. So for example, in, in Venezuela, state media outlets, they sp spread pro-government messages through AI-generated image uh, videos of English-speaking news anchors meant to mimic non-existent channel. And this was created by a company that is known specifically for working on deep fakes. The problem isn't just that people are going to think something is real when it's actually fake. The problem is that it makes it easy to deny when something is true because people are going to think are, are going to think it's fake or they're going to claim it's fake for their own benefit. And so for example, in April there was a re this year there was a recording of a prominent Indian official who was disparaging fellow party members and he claimed that this content was machine generated. However, there were independent researchers that were able to confirm so that at least some of those recordings were in fact authentic. But not every time do we get a chance to, to have this uh, independent party verify. And so as a journalist, but also as the general public, we need to be incredibly, incredibly careful as what, what it is that we outright believe. So this is... Uh, if I wanted to kind of catfish somebody um, and tell them that I, this is me and that I am holding a fox, I can use this for, I don't know, a dating profile if I've ever had considered one or my LinkedIn image. Um, and and if, I used, if I spend a little bit more time on this and use a different tool, I can actually get it to look more like me. And then I can claim that I, I'm a fox rescuer or something, right? But... This is actually me holding a fox, and <laughs> it's not quite as glamorous. But then we've got like somebody like this. So, um, you know, so some of these deep fakes, they're meant to be silly, and some of them are used to be a tool that's not, it's not always politically motivated, right? Sometimes it's just to get people to buy something. Uh, so here we have, you know, this is somewhat believable. I mean, Trump loves gold. He allegedly has a gold toilet. Actually, not allegedly. He actually has a gold toilet. So it makes sense that he'd be, you know, shilling for gold. Um, so, and then here we have an image of Trump embracing Fauci, and that particular image made quite a stir, and it was actually released by the DeSantis campaign. And of course, a lot of people are, um, you know, uh, who support Trump are maybe not so keen on Fau Fauci, so it's not a great image to see go around, and it's sort of playing on the idea that was already there that he sort of sped up the, the vaccine. Um, but it's interesting, so according to NPR, the DeSantis team campaign basically said, well, we'll stop doing this when Trump stops doing this. <laughs> so they're all engaging in these things. So this is like the image of, that they would have worked from to get to the image of the embrace. But in real life, you know, you can see they're not quite as friendly as that. So what a lot of this stuff does, it will take a grain of truth and then build on that. And that's what makes it somewhat believable. So here we have the Dalai Lama with a samurai sword, um, which is, I guess, innocent enough and kind of fun. But then we have like a boy 
which is an image that's very evocative, right? It's a striking image. It's a war battle. The narrative is that it's in Gaza. He has a shirt on with a Palestinian flag. And we're meant to believe that, you know, it's his mother lying dead to, next to him. And it's a powerful but emotion, an emotional image. But then if you look at his hand, he has six fingers. <laughs> And, and, you know, and, and you kind of make you wonder, like, why even use this kind of imagery in the first place? I'm sure there are, like, war imagery. But this particular image is very kind of memorable. It's, it's evocative. And so it, it, it tells a story. And so that's one reason to use it, even if you had real images from war. We have another one. Again, this is an image that's very evocative. You know, a father rescuing his kids from the rabble. There's something very heroic that it's representing. But again, we have on closer examination, we've got, you know, it doesn't quite match up with reality. We've got too many, too little, too few toes, too, few, too many toes. AI right now is not very good with fingers and toes. Um, but I suspect it will get very good at that eventually. And so right now we have telltale signs that we can look for, but we may not have that in the future. Here we have um, a building struck. This was a very widely shared 17 second clip. Uh, and so it was showing nine before and after photos. It got at least 1 time, uh, 1.2 million views on social media. And it shows these buildings have been destroyed and the claim is that it is attached to it as it's from the Israel-Hamas conflict. But this is an, actually an image from Syria, Aleppo, Syria. And it was taken during, in tw 2011 during the civil war there. Then we have the Israeli strike on Gaza, or so are we, we are meant to believe, but it's actually in reality drone footage from an earthquake in Turkey. But not uh, different sides do this, right? It's not just one side, though. I would argue that it happens a bit more in some areas than others. But here we have a clip that was widely shared. It was meant to sort of go with this um, narrative of Pallywood, so um, creating fake, fake narratives. Um, and, and this is all staged, like the war, the consequences, everything is staged. So this particular video, because one of the bodies or two of the bodies end up moving, is, was believed to be you know, staged by Hamas or Palestinians. But the thing is, it is, this is actually from, um, so this actually comes from the, if you do a reverse image, uh, search, we find out that this was actually from a demonstration that was staged by dozens of students from the Muslim Brotherhood at Al Azhar University in 2013. So it actually has nothing to do with the conflict to begin with. And here are a few other examples. This is, comes from a, a journalist at BBC Verify, and he's been really good about posting disinformation coming out uh, from the war on both sides. So here we have one talking about the fake injuries. So in this case, this video was of um, showing very kind of bloody conflict, but this was actually a short film. Um, so those were scenes from a short film. This guy's been around. Oh, so this this was a more recent video. This again, you attach kind of a particular narrative to it, but we don't know where this narrative even comes from, right? But in reality, it's um, this video was actually it was something that was documented, and it's not actually showing what you think is showing. And if you watch it in, or uh, if you translate it, you realize that he's just saying, "No, I'm okay, mom," because they need to use uh, the space for something else. And, you know, and this is, I think, is really important point that I want to make is regardless of who you support or don't support, if you allow false information, if you share false information, it actually discredits you. It makes you untrustworthy and it can be used against you. So I think it's very, very important to get things right, regardless of whether it supports one's narrative or not. 
And here I have a slide on um, some of the ways that deep fakes can be identified. I know it's a little bit covered by the, um, but basically what you're looking for um, right now, because we're looking for inconsistencies. So AI, as I mentioned, still struggles a bit with fingers, eye movement, facial expressions, skin tone, inconsistency inconsistent bokeh, so usually if you generate an image, your, your background is not gonna be quite so real looking. And then lip movement. And with audio, it can be a little bit more choppy, um, a bit superficial, cut in weird places. But the problem is I do think that it's just a matter of time before it gets so good that we will not be able to know the difference. So what is it that we can do about it? And I think there are things that we can watch out for right now. You know, we can do image um, reverse searches. We can do, we can translate videos where we don't know what, the lang what they're saying in the language. And we can educate people to see what it is that they can look for. But in a few years, I do worry that AI is just gonna get better and better. And so it's gonna be much more difficult to discern. And you're gonna need like very complex tools and some of them are being worked on, but they're not coming quickly enough. And they're not embedded in the social media platforms, which is what I would advocate for. So for example, we have tools like Community Notes on um, X, formerly known as Twitter, I think is the obligatory line to accompany this name with. Um, and I think they do a good job of things like tracing back videos. And the problem is comments don't always appear quickly enough. Um, and, uh, and, and it's difficult to, to research some of the stuff. So, and it has the opportunity to spread very widely before it actually gets caught. But, um, you know, and we want to, train ourselves to spot inconsistencies. So for example, if you have somebody who's carrying something really dirty, but they're clean, right? And if you have something, you know, like I said, reverse image search uh, is pretty w a good way to find out if this image was published years ago. And I think critical thinking, you know, still remains such a, the most powerful tool in, in terms of distilling this, uh, but it's not enough. And while I think that, you know, I know that uh, fact-checking organizations have sometimes gotten a bad reputation. I do think that if the good fact-checkers are, are quite essential um, because they have more resources and ability and skills to trace back these things. And we don't want it to just take it face value. And then ideally what I would advocate for is having a social media platform, having the social media platforms immediately identify if something is generated by AI um, when you upload it and labeling it as such. So I think it's really important for, for social media companies to be partners in this and, and have these tools be part of it. And then another thing that I've been advocating for is citations. So voluntary citations, but citations on platforms like Twitter or any other platform where you can tell your audience where you're getting this information so they can confirm. And I think it also builds trust with the people who do provide that voluntarily. So, you know, I think as AI gets better, it's just going to be more and more sophisticated. And in terms of political disinformation, that's gonna be harder and harder to battle. And as we've seen, the lies tend to travel so much better than the correction. So we need to establish better systems to counter it. And sometimes I have to be honest, sometimes I do feel like the situation is too dire, but I'm a, a little bit of a Pollyanna. Uh, so <laughs> I'm hoping that we can counter that was both with like education and with building better tools that kind of attack the problem at its root. And we do, we need to, as individuals, we need to spend more time verifying this content and not sharing it until it can be verified. And while I think that, you know, AI will help journalistic organizations get reporting out quicker and assist with research, like there are some, I, I've, I've looked at a few interesting tools that help me organize, summarize the data that I'm researching. There's some really good things that are actually coming out uh, soon. And, it's so important that human oversight remains. So maybe machines will not fully replace us, right? Because I think there are definitely areas where humans are needed. 
And AI is great because it can do things that waste human time and don't require the perspective and skills and creativity of a human. Like I mentioned transcription, which I think plenty of people in this room hate doing. Um, repetitive tasks, no one wants to do that. Um, and it, takes, it saves time and it allows humans to be good at what humans are actually meant for and realize their potential in, in, a, in a better way. But our future actions and, and thoughts, they depend on an accurate portrayal of reality. And so we cannot afford to mix up fact with fiction. And I generated this image because it's the end of my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I was reading somewhere today, well, I think I'm re just reading a newspaper actually, but online, because you never get physical newspapers yeah, because anymore. People don't read anymore. No, no, nobody reads them anymore. But that's only been relatively just about a couple of years, but one of the articles in it was about the, um, the, 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 uh, the latest word being added to the Oxford English Dictionary which is hallucinate as an AI term, not as a drug-related term connected with the LSD that I used to know about in the 70s. I didn't know we needed drugs to hallucinate. Oops. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I find this term, you know, you used it. Um, AI is hallucinatory. So could you clarify that a bit more? So I'm, I'm not quite clear how it hallucinates. Well, the way that AI works is it's trying to complete sequences. So sometimes it cannot complete the sequence. And so because essentially it's programmed to give you something, it just comes up with something and it's completely rubbish. It's, it doesn't, so they call it hallucination. It's obviously not hallucinating as a person would, but it is a similar process. It's just because it cannot complete the sequence properly. Okay. So coming back to your point about, you know, we need to have, uh, to understand reality, we've got to deal with the facts, not with the fiction, as you said at the end. In fact, the hallucinatory is all fictional or is potentially fictional, but we see it as real. Well, we can mistake it for real because if we don't, if we rely too much on these tools where we don't actually... Um, double check it, and we don't understand where that information came from, then yeah, we can take something because it sounds, it makes sense. Like if you get it to write a biography of you, you'll know immediately that it's like making things up. But if you write, ask it to write a biography of someone else, you're not going to know unless you verify it. So that's the problem. And the problem is human beings in general have this issue of, of like being overly reliant on reading one article, one book, hearing somebody say something, reading something online. So now they're going to go to AI and I think event, it's going to soon come to things like Alexa and Siri. You're going to be able to just say, hey, Siri, tell me, you know, the answer to X and Y. And you have no, you're not going to be spending the time double checking and finding out how Siri got to where Siri got with the answer. So, I mean, it, the, the, one of the problems is the, um, the amount of information we're subject to now and the inability to kind of process it um, intel well, effectively. And that because there's so much information and because it's so fast, we live in a an age of hyper speed in terms of communication and um, the media. Um, we, th there's no potential really for a gatekeeper, like the traditional media. If you, when I was reading a newspaper, you'd have an editor or a senior journalist who had a you know, certain knowledge of the world who would, and you had fact checkers, yeah. you know, for lots of them, major, you know, political you journals. <laughs> yeah. You don't seem to have that anymore. No, I mean, and that's a financial problem. But, but what you're saying is very true. I think on the one hand, AI is fantastic because unlike a human, it can take all of that data 
and it can very quickly process. So you can get a more accurate answer in some ways than you know if you were to ask a human because they're, the knowledge database is so vast, more than any human could possibly have. And in that way, it's, it's almost godlike in its intelligence, as they say. But on the other hand, how do you know if what it's saying is true, because as a human being, you don't have the capacity to verify it. So I think we're gonna face some of these questions because I don't know, you can verify it. So I guess you'll have to verify the, the integrity of the system itself. But as we see, like it, it, the hallucination problem is incredibly serious and not something that they've been able to get past to date. Mm. And like I said, some believe they'll, it will never be the case, but. So, so there's a real problem, you know, with, with the idea of truth now, in terms of um, the, the amount of information you're getting and the way the information might have a kernel of truth, but is deliberately using that kernel to misinform or disinform. And it's interesting, there, there was a Harvard philosopher called Harry G. Franklin, who wrote a very short but very interesting book, actually in, in the 90s, called On Bullshit. Uh, and, you know, he said, well, rather than an age of outrage, we're in an age of bullshit because bullshit is not actually a lie. It uses a kernel of truth to misinform in a way that gives credence to the misinformer, if you like, and dupes the, the victim, the hearer. So we're, called, we're kind of in a bullshit condition, do you think? Sure. I mean, but but this is part of human nature, and I think humans always told bullshit. bullshit yeah. But it's on a maximal stick. Scale. Yeah. Well, the problem is it's being rewarded, and it's and it spreads at a much quicker pace. So the scale of this bullshit is mm. is is vast, and it's harder because if you have a conversation with a friend, and they, and they say something utterly ridiculous, um, you know, there's probably going to be some immediate response to that. But when you come, you know, a lot, for example, these influencers, the people that follow them generally follow them because they admire them, yeah. they like them, they agree yeah. with them. So whatever it is, they, the narrative they put out, they're already kind of conditioned to agree and believe, with, uh, believe in. And like you said, it's the grain of truth is so essential because every good lie has a grain of truth, yeah. right? And so if you, I mean, these... And well, and they'll say, like for example, with a video that was shot in uh, Syria being misrepresented as being shot elsewhere, what they'll say is, "Well, I'm telling the truth. I mean, there is a person suffering. I'm just using this to represent <laughs> a particular narrative." So they'll always find something because they have a little grain of truth to cling to, and the and the people who want to be fooled are much more easily fooled because they're 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 already conditioned to agree with these people. And then they, and you see how much, like my favorite accounts on social media are, don't have a lot of followers. They're really thoughtful, nuanced, but that kind of thing does not travel well, right? And the people who do best, the people of millions of followers do tend to be the kinds of people who distill things into their very basic essence, add a lot of drama to it and outrage and bullshit. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and, but it's popular and it's rewarded. It, it's truly rewarded, whether it's rewarded by likes and attention or it's rewarded by financial rewards, mm. which I think make it an even more dangerous situation in some ways. Okay. Very good. Um, well, I mean, there was a lot in that discussion, so I'm sure people have got some questions for Catherine. Honest. Logan? Thanks. Thanks for a very interesting presentation. I have two quick questions, one on accuracy and one on anonymity. So I had a similar uh, experience when I tried to use ChatGBT, and I, I never used it again after this, where I, you know, I'm writing, uh, doing information for a book, I put in a query, it gives me a bunch of fantastic, realistic sounding answers, and then I check them and most of them are completely made up, right? They're just, they're just wrong. So my question with respect to that is, given the, I mean, I work a lot with very controversial subjects. Uh, even one inaccuracy is kind of fatal to my argument. Will, in your opinion, we ever get to a level of accuracy with these tools that we could actually really rely on them to do primary 
research in this way. So that's that's question one, because um, I wasn't super optimistic based on my own uh, first experience. And then secondly, I'm wondering whether in this kind of age of more and more sophisticated fakery, whether anonymity is going to be downgraded because the only way I can trust anything is if it's like Jeremy with his name and his address and every, you know exactly who I am and I've put all my credibility on the line that this particular thing is real and that a lot of good stuff we have right now that's shared by people who are anonymous, it's just going to kind of disappear because nobody will be able to trust it um, given where, where we're sort of moving to. So if you could comment on either of those two sure. thoughts. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so the first question in terms of whether it's going to be reliable, the, the truth of it is I don't know. It will probably get much more reliable over time, but there could be like the thing that I mentioned where it's, it's, it's learning from itself. That might actually really hinder the progress or maybe they change something about it. So it's hard to predict sometimes because people come up with very interesting solutions to problems and we don't expect them. But at the same time, I think we can't forget, like where I think it's a good tool for research because I do use it that way. It isn't, I don't take what it wrote to me, but I, I can ask it, for example, if I wanted to find patterns, right? Um, find patterns, let's say, about policies mm -hmm. and, uh, around the world. That's something I have used it on. And it will give me an answer, and then I go and I research it, make sure that it's true. But it points me in directions that would have been much more difficult for me to find on my own because it's able to com kind of compute all this stuff um, in a way that a human brain can't or a search engine can't. So, and then your second question about anonymity, I do think there's a lot more trust for people who use, because they have something at stake. And of course, not everyone can be uh, not anonymous because they're afraid sometimes for their lives, for their reputations, careers. But I do think it will make it, but, but you can fake a name too. You can fake an image. So that's gonna be, I think verifying that it's gonna be harder, but also you can Right, can't, but maybe on, sorry to yeah, interrupt, yeah, but no, like no. on X, for example, there's something where I sign up and they have specially blessed me that, yeah, we've, con we've talked on the, I mean, maybe video call, whatever it is, you know, we went to his house and talked to him. This is a real person. Uh, he works where he says he works and we'll kind of go to this hyper yes. non-anonymity so that people, mm -hmm can have some remaining credibility. I kind of wonder whether we might sort of be heading. Oh yeah, I think direction. I think so because and and you can see it with like I know Elon indicated Elon as an Elon Musk has <laughs> I'm not on first name basis, but um, he has indicated that um, you know, he would verify, and I know he had sort of, he already has a system in the back end, um, which you can accidentally access sometimes, uh, where they wanted to take documents um, and so verify your ID completely. Um, have you on camera live? I mean, there's lots of ways to sort of verify whether somebody's a real human. Uh, he's claiming that the reason he's charging money for the service is to verify that you're not a bot, that a, the bot can also get a credit card, a disposable one. So there's ways around everything. I think the other thing that's kind of interesting with AI, you also lose your uh, anonymity, uh, your, un please say the word for yeah. me. Anonymity. Thank you. David is my uh, pronunciation expert. <laughs> and um, the thing about it is, is because it can track all these patterns. So I'm afraid that none of us are going to be anonymous in a few years because our voice signature is unique. Um, even the patterns of how we write is unique and, and AI is able to process that data very quickly across so many platforms. So I think we will not have the opportunity to be anonymous. And I, that kind of concerns me actually. Okay, um, there's a question over here. Oh, sorry, sorry Ben, and then this. Uh, thank you for your very interesting talk. Do you think there could almost be like a perverse optimistic accelerationist take on AI in as much as we've seen such an unhealthy level of technologization in our life, working online, online dating, people having these very parasocial relationships across the internet with podcasters and YouTubers and OnlyFans girls. And maybe the level of uh, unreliability online and the inability to distinguish between what's real and what's fake will make us kind of re-embrace what's organic and local and immediate to us because we, we no longer have trust in anything except the kind of 
face-to-face -face experience. I think that's a, an excellent point. Um, I do think, I've been thinking about that for a bit, like also what is it about us humans that makes us human? Because I think AI is really going to allow us to really redefine that because, you know, obviously a lot of jobs are going to be replaced, but those are the kinds of jobs that don't uh, encompass our humanity. And so I think and we see this already, like in the mass consumer market, right, where things are mass manufactured, fast fashion, there is an audience for things that are, you know, your artisanal markets, uh, things that are made by hand. When you go to a farmer's market and you meet the, the farmer, so there is an interest in that and that whole hipster culture kind of comes from that as a reaction. So I think we're going to see that uh, indeed. I think we're going to have people want more face-to-face -face interactions. But, you know, one thing that we... I talk a lot about is community and we just don't have um, the same way of having communities anymore. I actually think that is a big part of the distrust. I think it's a big part of the mental health crises that a lot of places are experiencing. And so perhaps it will push us because th there's these ideas that, you know, people want to live in the metaverse and there are people buying land next to other famous people, you know, I don't think that the average human <laughs> really wants that. And I think they're going to, the more we push this kind of superficial world, uh, the more people are going to long for humanity. But at the same time, I also see them pushing that in things like, I know there are robots being developed to take care of the elderly. And in some ways you do need that because there are places in the world where they just don't have enough people to take care of them. But at the same time, that seems like a very cold experience. Well, it's a question over there. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for your impressive lecture. And my question concerns the intellectual history for I'm a historian. And maybe uh, you know the famous books, book of Benedict uh, Anderson under the title Imagine Communities. communities, but it uh, concerns the early modern age, albeit uh, that statements about the book printing as a revolution of the information and a, a form of the new uh, uh, intelligence uh, took the uh, market of uh, ideas, competition, blah, 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 as it uh, written a book of Benedict Anderson. So my question concerns that can you imagine that such uh, new forms of the intellectual, of, of, of the culture as the market of ideas, can this artificial intelligence uh, recall new forms of competition, of comp not competition, competition is always uh, uh, has, has been bigger, albeit new forms of competitive, competitive meaning, competitive, new, uh, more concisely people, albeit we realize that artificial intelligence destroy the uh, thinking and uh, development of concise people, albeit as Benedict Anderson, and I'm finishing my question with the Benedict Anderson uh, summarized that uh, Everybody uh, was in fear that the new revolution of a form of the new intelligence, uh, the, the book printing, uh, albeit the uh, uh, market of ideas, this uh, uh, expression of Anderson, took great, great, great development in the, in the uh, uh, history of people, uh, uh, free thinking people, conscience thinking people, because they purchased what they wanted to read. So nowadays, people may choose two ways. They accept any foolish, silly thing uh, from the uh, uh, mass media, or they can be more, even more concise people. Similarly, to the early modern age, uh, describe it in the monograph of Benedict Anderson, one of my favorite writers, so that's why I uh, took this question here. Thanks a lot.
Thank you. Um, so Benedict Anderson wrote a book called Imagine Communities, which argued that he used the example of Indonesia and the, the notion that Indonesia w was a construction, really, of the printing press and the desire of a nationalist group to create, you know, modernity through the nation state. So I think part of the question is then, you know, in that sense, the media, the media at the time, the printing press, enabled a certain identity to emerge. And the question then is, this AI is creating us in different ways, but we can use that creatively or not so, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, um you know, with the printing press, and then we had, you know, newspapers and magazines, and um, and there was a more united identity um, in the sense that, you know, most people were reading the same things. And with just even the internet, suddenly you were only reading what you wanted to read, what you were already interested in. And with AI, I mean, you have, some would argue because different AI models have different training material, and that training material might have some ideological roots, and they, you know, some of it wants to stay positive and, and have a particular vision for the world. And I know Elon Musk released Grok, which is, uh, he wants it to have juvenile humor be part of it. Um, these things, you know, these tools I do think um, influence the more you interact with them, I imagine they do influence people, but also I think people's choices influence them. So, so it's, it's kind of a, a symbiotic relationship. Um, I don't even think that necessarily all the people who design these tools want to do it with this agenda to influence them, but nonetheless, because they train them, it does. And if it only shows some information to you and not all information, and it positions it in certain ways that are meant to be, um, you know, polite or a pr promote a particular narrative, and you and people are using it in huge vast numbers, then I can't imagine that it wouldn't have some sort of an impact on the way that people perceive the world and and some kind of an ideological bent. But I guess the solution to that is to develop numerous tools so that people have options and diversity of use. But I find that all these tools really are, are um, as much as I'm an individualist and I like to be able to like search for what I want, it takes away from the depth of understanding of the world if you're only reading the things that like interest you and not only interest you, but also serve, have the bent, the ideological bent that you're already looking for. So you only engage with people who who follow that or AI tools that follow that. I, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> or, thank you. Okay, um, some other question? Rod? You know, uh, uh, Alistair McIntyre, the philosopher, said 40 years ago that the West had entered in a period, into a period where emotion was considered uh, a valid and even a, a preferential uh, guide to the truth. And in that case, said McIntyre, we can't have a society if people, if, if it's only based on that kind of subjectivity. Uh, and we've seen since then this sort of mentality grow more and more in society where now if you challenge someone's, a claim someone makes, they may come at you and say, you're attacking my identity, you're attacking my lived experience, et cetera. I'm wondering uh, to what extent AI would um, go on to uh, um, make that, to support that, that way of thinking. In other words, if we can't believe as a fundamental approach to the world that truth is something objective, um, is it possible at all to resist AI lies? Oh, good, good question. That's a great question. Hmm. I think that, um, I mean, I, I'm one of those people who is much more, you know, interested in, not that I'm not emotional, but I like, you know, I do believe that there are facts, right? I mean, we can challenge whether the world exists, but at a certain point we have to accept that it does and, and, uh, and then go along with it. Um, with these tools, 
in some ways they can be beneficial because an AI is not going to be actually offended that you're challenging their lived experience. Um, and so if you're able to program it in a way that it takes out the emotion, the problem is it is still taking people, other people's emotions into consideration when it answers questions because where is it getting this information from? A lot of it comes from articles that have the subjectivity of emotion. At the same time, I'd say, is emotion completely irrelevant in, in right? So, so for example, one area where AI is going to be used is in the legal system. And if you read a case on its surface, sometimes it's quite easy. Well, for the AI, it's not a problem to make a determination based on the loss. But a sympathetic judge may look at the person with their emotion and think, you know, if I punish them in this way, this is actually going to be a worse result. And I can see there's something in their eyes that makes them sort of, I think, I think they, we can work with this. Let's give them another chance, right? And we've seen that happen in the court system. And you can say, well, that's, that's leaving a lot of subjectivity in the legal system. But at the same time, it can benefit people. So I'm reluctant to say that emotions don't play any role, right? Well, in, in a, hmm. along those lines, uh, uh, someone I know who's a nurse in Canada has told me how much concern she has about AI in the hospital system because hospitals are under pressure to reduce cost. And uh, she said what I see taking place or, or starting to form in my hospital is administrators and senior physicians uh, using AI to estimate when very sick patients are likely to die and then making healthcare decisions on what to withdraw based on that. And in that way, they can outsource the human decision making. That would be difficult. They could say, well, AI told us this. I mean, that's, that is something I think we really need to be concerned about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think even the order in which a patient might be seen uh, is something that's determined by nurses. And they, they'll talk to you, and um, but they evaluate you um, when they talk to you, not just the question, the answers to your questions. But with AI, you know, you're taking completely that human aspect out of it. And it's also prone to making mistakes. But again, we can argue humans make mistakes as well. Uh, and perhaps AI is more accurate. But at the same time, I, I, I do worry that it's, um, it's, it's, kind of a cha it's kind of a difficult conundrum in some ways because taking emotions out can actually be helpful in some cases and putting emotion, but at the same time, our emotions are what makes us human and contributes to a lot of our inventions and progress and, and how we engage with each other. Even on that very basic level, nowadays, if you go to a store, a lot of times you have self-checkout. And you might say, this is great. I, I'm an anti-social at times, so I <laughs> kind of like that. But at the same time, I think it, it destroys something because maybe if you have a more human interaction with that cashier, uh, and you sometimes you do, and sometimes you make little jokes, there's something that makes you part of, part of the human race, and that's breaking that apart. Yeah, well, I think, you know, with coming back to Rod's point just a bit, the, the emotion that McIntyre was referring to, particularly the political emotion, was rage, not, not empathy, you know. And, and the internet or the, the social media has the power through its use of um, imagery, you know, sort of um, horrific you know, or, or, you know, powerful imagery to enrage people. Yeah, and rage is a much more powerful emotion. People respond, inter engage, interact with rage most, which is what they want. At the same time, like I, I've been trying, because I, I want our social media experiences to be more positive. And how do you elevate things that are um, more positive to, to a human? And like, even like, you know, sometimes that does happen because there are accounts that, you know, post cute puppies and funny videos and those do really well too. So it does show you that people can be just as engaged with uh, the things that don't cause rage, but actually kind of a positive emotion. So how do we make sure that there is more of that and that's being pushed out more than the rage inducing things that only really serve to, I think, make us <laughs> very upset, depressed and, and not like each other very much. I wonder if you have anything to say about uh, the use of AI in uh, education currently. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are currently history or humanities teachers, and they're 
they report that this is just completely rampant right now um, you know, in, in high school and in uh, early college. I mean, something like 60 to 70 percent of papers they're receiving are AI involved in some way. There's a lot of AI cheating, and that's just the stuff that's uh, you know easy to catch because it cites you know it, it talks about events that did not happen and things like that. Um, but it's written too well. Yes, it's uh, things that are written too well. That's another tell, but it's hard to prove uh, in front of the dean certainly. Uh, but I wonder if uh, this seems like it's one of the few uh, unambiguously bad. Uh, uses of AI technology, and I wonder if um, is this something that you've encountered, and do you have any thoughts on this, and how do you think it's uh, it'll be possible to uh, combat this? I actually do because my sister is a high school teacher, <laughs> so we argue about this, and she definitely gets uh, AI generated essays, and she can tell because well, I used to grade things too. Um, unfortunately, high schoolers are not very good at writing. Uh, however you know, you can put it, you can do it so that the AI learns their own voice, their style of writing, and does an essay in their voice. So that will make it even harder to detect. And they have software that detects it, but it's not that great. And I recently met somebody from Google who works on the tech side of AI and detection. He said, they're not sure that they're going to be able to solve this problem. Um, it's a very difficult thing, specifically with text. Images and videos might be more solvable in terms of IDing AI, but text is very difficult to ID. So um, when I talk to my sister, her view is that um, we need to think of different ways to challenge students. So th we see things coming back like oral exams, writing the essay in class, no Wi-Fi. Um, so things like that. And she, um, also presentations like projects, uh, presentations like this. And at the same time, I, my debate with her was that I think essays, for example, are still really essential because they help you organize your thoughts, um, logical way, you know, in a way that I don't think other, other assignments would. But I guess we have to change because this is the reality, and I don't think we're going to be able to combat that for long in terms of being able to identify um, AI. I also hear there's like reward systems that are by, uh, kind of uh, given by AI in terms of like if the kid has participated enough or done this enough and those incentive systems are very kind of dehumanizing I think. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? All right. Um, my question is that recently, I think last year, European Union, the European Parliament and the Council passed a act, basically the Digital Services Act, I, uh, if I remember correctly. And this is a regulation, so this directly affects every single European Union country and it aims to create um, a uniform framework for all European countries to establish a more accountable and transparent digital environment on all social media platforms. And it includes a specific function, which is the report button, which can, which is, I think it's a very cool user-based feedback system and users basically empowered to report um, information which is not legitimate. Um, so my question is, that do you think that we reached a point of madness that these regulations, which are legally binding and they are coming from supranational institutions, are these necessary to stop or, or to limit disinformation or because I think the governmental or supranational intervention in in, in social media or on, on digital platforms was unheard of a few years ago I think so I'm just curious about your your view on this sure um in general I like to motivate users and platforms 
to choose to do the right thing on their own, but humans <laughs> don't often do that. So in some cases, I do believe in government intervention. Um, I mean, social media platforms already have report buttons. The problem is how do you um, enforce that? How do you do it fairly? How do you do it so it doesn't censor somebody for saying something that is true from just their opinion? And we've seen that um, how government involvement has been so strong in terms of like uh, telling social media companies to take down specific content. But at the same time, like, you know, for example, um, having... I don't have an issue with having a government mandate that social media companies and perhaps support them some way in developing these tools, but identify, require to identify AI generated images. Because I don't think it's the same. You're still allowing people to speak what they want to say, but you are giving more information, more context about that information. And I think in that way, I think governments can have a role. I just don't want them to be in the in the business of telling people like what they can and cannot say because we've seen how they can censor true things as well. Eric, over to you. Oh, thanks, thanks. Uh, um, so this is the, to the whole topic is about uh, deciphering truth in the age of AI. Uh, may I may I, uh, um, make one possible suggestion? I wonder if you if you would agree with this that actually. AI, though it has some potential risk for the future, uh, is right now not a really serious uh, risk to the truth in the public sphere. And it is instead the video and the real, the, these video reels on social media, that those are the true, the true killer. Uh, so there's some, so for instance, in the Dutch press, recently this, this, this picture with the six-fingered boy it was actually printed in a serious newspaper. But then actually social media helped expose the, the fake, um, uh, especially written social media, such as Twitter. Twitter is actually very informative. I really think that on the Hama uh, Hamas-Israel war currently, you're much better informed if you critically follow various Twitter accounts than if you, than if you read the mainstream press. That's, that's been my impression. Uh, but it's really, what really the true pit is, that all these video-based social media, uh, TikTok, but also the reels on Facebook, because they, 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 they give you an image and images can be very deceptive. And whether they're, you know, they don't have to be AI generated, they just grab your emotions because that's what visuals do. Visual uh, uh, um, sight is a much more powerful sense than the other human senses. So we're, we're an animal species that responds most powerfully to sight. So you're, you're impacted by these videos, they hit you emotionally, and that's really where the truth is lost, I believe, in, in our public spheres now. This is that these, these are thousands of thousands of videos and all our, all our young kids just scrolling as zombies through all these videos and, and in a, on a, in a, on a semi-conscious level absorbing, absorbing the images in a, in a very non-rational way. So isn't, isn't this what we're really facing? And the AI is kind of a, it's still a funky gimmick, and it's 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 so it's it is it is AI is important, and your this topic is very important. But AI might be might serve the truth as well. So it's not it's not the great enemy of the truth right now. The great enemy of the truth, I think, is the, the visual is visual social media culture. I think something that might happen actually, because um, I was thinking about this the other day, because Elon Musk uh, created Grok, and Grok actually. Um, listens, it follows the social media on Twitter, X, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it, it can do, could potentially be a tool that flags false information too. And then people can decide for themselves if they agree or not. You don't necessarily have to take down the post, but at least um, it can do it in a much more bigger mass scale, especially when something is factually wrong or it can locate that image, right? It can do automatically an image reverse search. And then, so there's ways that I think um, AI could absolutely be used to battle some of this stuff. At the same time, like you said, it's a visual a medium, people tend to believe images, images are powerful, videos are even more powerful. And then um, we see, and vo voice recordings. And I think what we're gonna see more of, we just haven't seen as much yet. And I think we're gonna see it a lot in the US election cycle, because you already see that how likely they are to use it. Um, I think we're gonna see mo much more content that's generated showing absolutely false things. 
and it's really, really, really hard. Um, and other platforms, you know, community notes is great. I will praise that. Other platforms don't have anything like that. So TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. So I can imagine how much these things can travel before they're corrected. And that really worries me. And also all these fake publications that people will copy from. <laughs> and then it ends up in real, like legitimate publications sometimes. But you can lie with a visual, you can lie with a picture, you can lie with video footage, even if it's real video footage. Uh, it's not, manipulata not manipulated, it's not edited, it's just the way it's cut is misleading. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's why I do think we already have had the problem and the problem grew because of social media. Um, but I think it's just going to become, it's going to be easier to push those videos out, for example, with bots, even the real videos, right, that are decept deceptively cut. Um, so that's one way that AI can kind of be used for evil in that way. But also, I think there's the fact that you can create an image that tells exactly the story you want to tell, that's powerful. Like I mentioned with the boy with the six fingers, you can find images of kids who've died, right, in the war, but this image is striking, it's powerful, it has a very particular narrative, and that's why it was used, and I see more of that happening, and that can be very effective. Doesn't mean we don't already have a problem. And like you said, I think AI can also be used to tackle some of these issues as well. I'm, I'm not, I'm not anti-AI <laughs> at all, um, but I think we, we often rush to adapt technologies, see how they can help us and su suit us and serve us, and we don't at the same time develop the tools. Like we, what should have been happening in my view. Um, for example, when you take a picture, it should have an ID that this is a photo. When you generate it, those companies that create these tools, this is another area where legislation, I think, would have been uh, a useful thing. I think there should have been legislation that for the companies themselves to put watermarks in these images. And that was not done. And by the way, somebody will figure out a way around that. It just won't be at scale. So you minimize the problem that way. Okay, thanks. Um, a last question, perhaps. Um. <laughs> Melissa, have the last word. So, Catherine, putting on your Hollywood hat, will we get a whole nother raft of movies dealing with AI run amok? in the next few years, now that the writer's strike is over? Are, are the movies going to be written by AI? Or are the no, movies going to no, be about just AI? on the topic. I mean, we've had a few, but shall we expect a deluge at some point of, you know, dystopian-themed? A hundred percent. I think I think dystopia in general... Is, is a genre that never goes out of business <laughs> <laughs> because it's so accurate. And you look at um, one of my favorite science fiction movies is Gattaca. We're like now reaching the time of Gattaca. And that's going to be our, you know, we talk about AI, we're going to start talking about genetic modification soon because that is a technology that's available and has so many moral, ethical implications and practical implications. I think that's going to be a genre explored but ai you know I, I think science fiction in particular dystopian genre it explores our fears and obviously what are humans really afraid of right now they're afraid of being replaced is one thing <laughs> and they're afraid of being destroyed if ai becomes you know self-aware um i i don't have that particular fear myself but um i don't think i don't think we're heading there but but replacement is going to be a fear and 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 how it dictates our society, our laws, and things like that. Putting too much power and trust in a system. I think that's going to be something that will probably be tackled by Hollywood and us. And the, the other point that you sort of mentioned there about AI writing movies. Well, that's going to happen too. Well, uh, according to the writer's strike, it's not quite going to happen. I mean, it can, it can write them. Or it, can, it, it does... Um, 
I don't think it's going to replace humans. I do think it's going to help writers a bit. You know, it might evaluate this script and say, structure it a little bit differently here, a little bit differently there, which, you know, is no different from the screenwriting book called Save the Cat that tells people how to kind of the mechanisms of structuring a story, which in some ways works, but at the same time as human beings, we often like to break rules. Mm -hmm. And when we break rules, that's often where we come up with the best results. Okay, thanks. And on that note, uh, breaking rules for our own good. We'll uh, call it a day, I think. And if you want to talk to Catherine afterwards, she'll be available for discussion. Thank you, Thank you David. <laughs>